Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with embodiment specialists from around the world. I'm your host, Mark Walsh. Today we're joined by Adam Barley. So Adam Barley is uh, one of the senior five rhythms dance teachers in the world. Someone who travels the world more than me. You're all over the place in all sorts of interesting places. Uh, He's worked on the Embodied Facilitator course with myself, done all kinds of movement and meditative practices over the years, which particularly associate with five rhythms. So for those of you who are new to that practice, this will be a good place to, um, uh, to get an introduction to that. So Adam, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Nice where, are you, you. where are you in the world today, Mr. Globetrotter? I'm in Eastern Australia. Eastern so Australia. It's, it's getting on in the day already. Wow. And it's, it's pretty early in the morning here. So um, I'm just getting up, having my coffee in Brighton. And, uh, and I'm know. having my ginger tea, as you do in Eastern. I'm in Byron Bay, so oh, they so offer ginger tea here. That's kind of the hippie capital of Australia, as I understand totally. it. Totally. Great. I imagine we'll get some listeners from there. They we tend to sort of Boulder, San Francisco, Byron Bay, Brighton. These are the the, yeah. of the alternative world. Well, let's dive in. I, I have just been in Sydney, so that you know, I don't I don't restrict myself to the hippie zones. You're all over. Yeah, I actually I actually love working in cities and in kind of more straight places. Okay, let's come back to that. I want to come back to that, those those distinctions a little bit. Um, first of all, how did you get into working with the body? That's always the question I, I start with with people. I was just really fucked up. <laughs> in my 20s, I was a mess. I, I was really a mess. You know, I, I didn't know how to make friends and I had a terrible, terribly painful relationship and I was a dad and didn't know how to be a dad. I, I hit a crisis point. I really hit a crisis point and I, I went to find a therapist and I was lucky enough to find a very good therapist because I think there's a lot of, you know, different therapists, should we say, out there. And I found a really good one who worked a lot with the body. And so immediately, like even in the first session, we were, we were doing physical stuff. And actually after a couple of sessions, he said, I think you should come to one of our groups. He and his wife led encounter groups for weekends. So I went to this weekend group and they're just doing all kinds of physical stuff there, including... Um, Osho's dynamic meditation. That was where I first did that, uh, which is like a, it's like it says, it's a dynamic meditation. It's a movement meditation that you do. Just going jump, through, act, jumping yeah. up and down and emotions. And- yeah, it's, it's very physical. It's very, it actually has got some interesting links to the five rhythms. But, but so, and, and doing that, when I first did Osho's dynamic meditation, I had the feeling like something, I felt like a, like a, African tribal warrior man, half animal, brilliant experience. It was just, it was life changing. It was fantastic, and the whole weekend was life changing. I did a lot of those groups, and 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 that kind of set me off on a trail of looking for experiences that would take me back home. Really, you know, like like, and I feel like I'm still going in that direction. You know, I'm still learning how to be myself at the age of 54 but that definitely working with the body has been my the the fastest way to move through my own bullshit and and to find what my own truth is before we get into your kind of core work you said something that's interesting me you know I I was said I was fucked up and that's why I got into this and that seems to be the story of pretty much everyone doing any kind of personal growth work right there has to be a big enough problem that you can step away from the the sort of mainstream culture and step onto a different path. And yeah, I mean, yeah. Why would you stop going down the pub and spend that money on body work <laughs> if you really didn't really need it? Yeah. I think it's good. You know, I think, I think you had, I think a lot of people get to that kind of crisis and yeah. I think it's re- it's, it's great. It's great yeah. to, have a, to really go, but oh, something is not right. And I mean, I, I think Thoreau was right when he said most people live lives of quiet desperation, and yeah. and it's actually it's it's actually in a strange way a relief when the desperation gets noisy enough that you do something about it. But well, in twelve step they call it rock bottom. You know, there's that. I think many people are living lives knowing something's not quite right, but it's not quite 
bad enough to do something about, to do something weird, yeah. like go to a fire rhythms class. Or, you know, I, 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 I had to be sort of suicidal before I stumbled into an Aikido class and was really kind of desperate for something, you know. Mm. Uh, yeah. It's also why I'm a bit suspicious to work with fairly new teachers of anything. I hope that doesn't sound too snobby, but there's that way in which if someone's still in their own life crisis and we're all in it to an extended sense. But um, uh, the other thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I'd like to come back to you on that because yeah. I think I know exactly what you mean. And I think you've got a good point, but everyone, everyone has to find their own level, you know, and, and not everybody is ready to go into this, some really deep dive full on sure. um, experience. And, and I think new teachers often work at a more, um, at a shallower level, should we say? Yeah, and that's just very natural. You know, you begin yeah. with just baby steps, and and that's perfect for some people. Yeah, actually, that's better for some people. Yeah, and I know we're all wounded teachers, but the sort of still bleeding profusely from the face lit teacher might not be such a good sort of. <laughs> you know, we're all wounded, but it's how wounded do you want someone to be with that that's guiding you? And the other yeah, thing, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, hopefully, anyone who gets up and starts teaching something has done enough of their own work that they're, you know, they, and that they're not going to bleed all over you as they're mm -hmm. attempting to teach you something. And that, that's something I like about the five rhythms training process is that you have to do a lot of prerequisites. You have yeah, to study for a I while. I had a couple of friends go through it while I was working with them and there was a serious <laughs> process they went through. Actually, one mm -hmm. thing I said is like, how do you work a job while doing that? I mean, they're required to do sort of 40 days of training in a year. I mean, it's way more holiday than most people are getting. You, you don't have to do it in one year. You don't have to do it in a year, so it's spread out, yeah. is it? Yeah, yeah. And you, just, you, you can actually take as long as you like to do the prerequisites, which is your own inner work okay. before you apply for the training. And, yeah. And I, yeah. I think that's good. And, it's, and actually, I think it's better if you take a long time over that. It's kind of popular enough, isn't it, as well? There's enough people doing the basic practices, and we'll come on to what these are in a minute. Um, and then, you know, people can kind of work their way up through it. Um, just lastly, though, on the teacher's thing, uh, there's a weird phenomenon I've come across lately, which is perfectly normal, well-adjusted people doing body stuff. So <laughs> this, this didn't really exist when you and I started this work. No, it didn't. And, and now it's mainstream enough that... It is. I was at a yoga it's like festival. like one of the things you do. It was all the popular kids are at the yoga festival and they're all beautiful and had good jobs and were sort of psychologically, you know, balanced. And of course that's maybe skin deep, but um, yeah, that's the other weird phenomenon that I've seen of late. It's not just us weirdos doing it now. So um, things have no, changed. Definitely. We've got a lot things more. Things have really changed. How have yeah. you seen that change as things have got more accessible in the world? It's not, not just in Byron Bay that you work now, right? Like there's no, something. No, it's not. I mean, every, yeah, everybody knows what mindfulness is. Mm. and everybody's heard of yoga and it's not weird and meditation is mainstream and 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 even you know even things like the five rhythms i you know when i first did it there were no evening classes anywhere to be found you know you could do the occasional workshop right and you know i lived in bristol and there was a small bunch of us wanted to dance every week we just hired a hall and kind of took a ghetto blaster and did it ourselves because there was no evening class anywhere for 500 miles around. And you're, showing, so, you're showing your age with ghetto blaster there, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my, I did my first classes with a cassette box of cassette tapes. Awesome. I'm, I, I do see people, because we should probably say what is Five Rhythms First of all. So could you give for someone who's completely new to this, because people listening to this may be martial arts teachers or yoga teachers, and it, it's still not known by everyone, is it? Like when I go to a yoga yeah. festival, for example, yeah. maybe 50% haven't heard of it. So what, what is Five Rhythms? A woman called Gabrielle Roth had people just dancing freestyle. Um, that was her sort of job as a teenager. She just got people to dance with no sort of set form or anything, not learning steps. And she started to study the people who were really free and spontaneous and sort of natural in their movement. And she noticed that those people tended to go through the same sequence of kind of like they, they would all do the same thing, even though they were you know, the most free and natural in themselves. They would all tend to start off moving in a sort of flowing way, like, like sort of gentle, fluid movements. And after a while, their movements would get more percussive and fiery and expressive. And then they would have a kind of cathartic release phase and after that they were lighter and more playful 
And after that, they would have a very still phase, um, sort of very more classically meditative. And after that, the whole thing would start again. And she observed this happening again and again and realized this is what freedom looks like in human movement. And so she, she, had, she started teaching people to go through those stages on purpose. Okay, everybody, let's move in a you know, fluid, flowing way. Okay, let's get more percussive and staccato. Okay, let's freak out and get chaotic. Okay, let's lighten up and be more playful and lyrical. And okay, let's all be more still and meditative. And she, she found that all kinds of stuff just started happening. And um, that it, it would encourage and engender a lot of like emotional release and people would have big sorry, psychological breakthroughs and realize that they actually loved their dad after all and 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 actually even to the extent of having very profound experiences that people would could only describe as a spiritual experience and um which we might say in more kind of common parlance an experience of oneness with everything feeling and being connected to everything and so that that's what the five rhythms are is they they at the most basic level they're just moving through that sequence of styles of movement and so you make up your own moves mm. as all the way along but you but you practice moving in those five ways so the key thing is understand it is you're listening to your body so you're actually you know it's a conscious mindful practice of movement meditation mm. if you will mm. you're listening to your body and you're spontaneously moving so everyone's moving in different ways but there's a there's a there's a cycle a rhythm that you're going through and um, you're taking through this this kind of cycle through different kinds of music normally, as I understand it. And I know there's different formats, but a typical format would be sort of two hours of kind of music and maybe a quick sharing at the end. And uh, basically, if you yes. walk into a class, it would look like a load of hippies jumping around going crazy. Mm-hmm. And, um, and all sorts of, you know, some people working with pairs, some people doing it on their own, sometimes group stuff. And, and then there's the workshop formats where there's different uh, sort of longer forms and different explorations. So is that sort of, I'm just trying to give people out there who've never yeah. seen the class a kind of picture of it. Yeah. And I, I would add a caveat for a couple of those things. Like I think these days, you know, people, people go to work with a teacher who they kind of resonate with. Yeah. And some teachers um, definitely attract a lot of more alternative hippie types, but some don't, you know, my favorite class in London in Paddington is like, it's just loaded, like lots of, like normal people who probably come out of an office or you know whatever, it doesn't look like a whole room full of hippies. And yeah, oh, so I'm, I'm thinking of the Brighton one that I go to around the corner. So it's um, yeah, that's you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bit of a, a different sample <laughs> for me here. I've, I've been to a few in other countries, and I went to one in Israel, and they, there was a kind of girl did like a yoga type warm up for it, which I really wasn't expecting. Mm-hmm. That I thought was really mm-hmm. very different because normally it's very free. Mm-hmm. And she just said, oh, she found that it was too free for people, and people freaked out, and they need oh. structure. Right. And yeah. um, so maybe it's different in, in different places. I've, I've danced. Yeah, and different, in different situations. Like when I've worked, sometimes when I've worked in the Eastern Bloc and um, I've, done, I've had a room full of people who are very new to it, I, I would absolutely start off in a very structured way, give people very structured exercises to, to just to get them um, in touch with what it's like to be physical yeah. in space. And, and yeah. that takes a while. And, and for many people, to move freely is like step three or five. It's, yeah, and so I see, I've seen people sort of get lost or confused by that. Though I've also seen people go compl- fairly straight laced, complete, completely new to it, come into a class, and because everyone else is doing it, they kind of go into the culture of it, you know. Um, and I guess yeah. the key idea, as I understand it, is the kind of body has wisdom, and there's a natural unfolding of the body which we can allow. So rather than sort of imposing something, we're yeah. getting into the body and allowing that. Unfolding, as you say, it often has some sort of healthy, I, you know, when I come out of a class, I feel like I've done a, uh, a year of therapy in a good way, you know, or I just, I'm not angry about something I was angry about, or yeah. I just, yeah. I've suddenly got a creative idea that I've been needing for breakthrough in my work or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. I mean, what are the yeah, main I'm, benefits? I guess what I'm asking. Well, that's interesting. You, you say that about, um, about freeing up so creative ideas and energy for creative projects is, because the five rhythms, like my description of how they how it involves moving through this sequence of five movement styles is like that's that's in a way the that's the entry point, but it's like this massive feast of possibilities um, of emotional work and psychological work and 
uh, and creative work. And actually the five rhythms are a map of the creative process. Like anyone who's, anyone who's written a book will know that, you know, you start off in a, in a kind of gathering ideas way, like, oh, I could do this and that. And that. It's going easily. And that's, flowing. that's the flowing stage. You know, you're, you're gathering everything. You're like open to all possibilities. And then you have to go into a, a more linear phase where you start getting organized and you go, well, okay, that's going to work. That's not going to work. This has got to go there and that's got to go next. And you get everything kind of organized. And then in any creative project, there's going to, you're going to have phases where, which are chaotic, where you're like, Ah, and everything's like jumbled up and falling apart and it's not going to work ah. and it, that's the third rhythm the rhythm of chaos and where the project kind of like has got you and you're like slightly out of control with it and and then if you manage to follow through then you're going to hit this point where it all just kind of goes ah and it's almost like you get like a sort of something drops into place you know like like magic and that's lyrical. That's the fourth rhythm where suddenly the, like, the storm clouds part and the rain, light comes out and you get a rainbow and suddenly you know what you're doing again. And, and the project goes through to completion, usually with, with a kind of ingredient from that lyrical phase that you didn't know beforehand that you were going to have. And, it, and it goes, everything goes, still goes into place and then you've got a finished project, product and that's stillness. And you know, I think for a music, if you're a musician or a, like it, any, any kind of creative project goes through those stages. In fact, relationships go through those stages again and again and again. And, it, and it's, I guess the advantage of, and I did a, another podcast on cycles that people might want to check out as well, but the advantage here of, of no, having a, a map of, of a cycle, a natural deep cycle like this, mm-hmm. is that you can spot where you get stuck, where you have a tendency, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, I've bailed out too soon, or you know, this is the bit that's mm-hmm. difficult for me, or this is the mm-hmm. bit that I get addicted to, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you can practice on purpose, you know, like, like if you, if you have a difficulty with getting organized and being, yeah. being linear and like seeing the big picture and figuring out what's going to go where you can practice that rhythm. And actually you can practice that rhythm, that second rhythm of staccato. You can practice it going through the five rhythms. So you could practice staccato in a flowing way and then practice it in a very staccato way. Then practice staccato in a chaotic way. Practice staccato in a lyrical way. Practice staccato in a still way. And yeah. So in that way, the five rhythms are kind of fractal maps. The soft similarity built into every aspect of of Gabrielle's maps, so that wherever you look, you can see the same kind of mandala of the same pattern of five. It's almost like looking through a five five sort of zoned kaleidoscope, and you see, oh yeah, that's, that's the same five again. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I know you sort of see this pattern everywhere and I'm, I'm not sure if it's cause it's a universal pattern or cause whether it's fire rhythms is a bit of a cult. I haven't, haven't made up my mind yet, but it's, uh, it's let me persuade you on that at some point <laughs> in this interview then Mark, because I've got a breakthrough. It's, well, it's, seriously, uh, I've got a breakthrough. We'll come to that. I've got to come to a new okay. work. Later on. I'm curious. I'm genuinely yeah. curious about that, but it is definitely, you know, something you can certainly see in the world. Like, you know, the classic example is the wave, right? Like this is often called, this is often called uh, a five rhythms dance class is often called a wave based yeah. on sort of a wave kind of breaking and the kind of chaos and then the lyrical kind of flow after that. Yeah. The, yeah. Breaking waves on the ocean shore that they just do go through those five stages. Yeah. yeah. And do. I, you do see it in nature in different ways. And I, I've definitely found it personally a useful map. And I know a lot of my students have, we have students come from martial arts, for example, and they're, they're used to a very structured pattern. And then, you know, night one of EFC course, they get Adam Bali and they're uh, rolling around on the floor and jumping up and down. And all of a sudden it's like a whole new world. And they might have, they may have worked. Let's say someone's listening to this as an Iyengar yogi and they might've got a lot from that practice and really learned a lot and, you know, done a very structured discipline practice, which could have been exactly what they needed. And then, you know, a more free practice that I get, it has its own discipline, its own structure. So I get that, yeah. but it, you know, this, um, freer practices can be really helpful for people that have just done more form-based practices. Is that fair to say? It is definitely fair to say. And I think the corollary goes the other way too. And, you know, for people who are like really like, oh yeah, let's be free. It can be very good for them to do a more structured practice. Yeah. We've had a few of those uh, fire rhythms or dance people generally come into EFC who are very kind of all over the place and they're quite maybe chaotic and their lives are quite chaotic Mm -hmm. and, they can do the staccato part they can do in an even more staccato form in a kind of structured way. And I find that definitely benefits people who are more, 
uh, without wanting to badmouth fire rhythms people because I've got many friends in fire rhythms and I've had several girlfriends from the fire rhythms world because it it does make people free and creative and attractive. There's no doubt about it. You know, if you look at the average person in the street and the average fire rhythms dancer, it's like wow, the fire rhythms dancer is doing something right in terms of it does do something. Yeah, in terms of like aliveness, in terms of presence, mm. in terms of freedom, in terms of sexiness. You know, it's just mm. when you see someone like I don't know, let's take a mutual friend of ours. Uh, actually, let's not name names, but this mutual yeah. fire rhythms friends we know, and it's like yeah. wow, they've got something right. Like it's had a benefit for them. Mm. Definitely. But I think you know, what you're touching on is a, is a really key point about all embodiment practices mm. that whatever you do physically has an effect on the whole of you. Yeah, you practical. can't do something physically and not be affected psychologically or emotionally. And, yeah. uh, and so it's really wise to pick your practice <laughs> and say, well, what, what do I really need right now? It's almost like, like what's the right medicine for me? Right yeah, now? What's the right training for me? Check you're not deepening your neurosis. And uh, pick something that will actually benefit your life. Like I did another podcast purely on practice. And I know you're, you're aligned on this, this idea of what's your practice. And if, if you're going to five rhythms, what's your practice within five rhythms, right? Like I might yeah. go with quite a strong intention. It might be like, you know what, Mark, you're uptight. You need to learn to let go. I want you to really get into the chaos tonight, you know? And in order to do that, you need to get into the parts before that. So there's, there's sometimes there can be that intention going into a class. And other times it's just, I just dance and then something magical happens. Yes. But it's, not, it's also not just about paying attention to any particular rhythm, but the, the way in which you practice any of the rhythms. And I, I wish people would do, I wish, I wish five rhythms dancers would, would pay more attention and to like the nuances of their practice and probably work individually with teachers sometimes. You know, the vast majority of five rhythms dancers actually yeah. go along to a, a class every now and then, let their hair down, and have a bit of a release and that's it. You know, and the majority don't ever do a workshop and they're really missing out. And the majority don't ever do any individual work and they're really yeah. missing out. Yeah, there's a different level of depth there, isn't it? And I, and I think yeah. if, if there's a danger, it's like people can just go jump around. I see sort of some people doing the same thing every week, like mm -hmm. never being on the floor or, you know, always dancing in a certain way. Or And, and I kind of kind of go, okay, well, that's fine. You know, dancing, it's nice. You know, it's good. Jump around. It's good, good fun. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm wondering if they're getting the depth without the sort of a little bit of guidance or structure or being challenged on certain things. Mm -hmm. um, can we give people an experience, Adam? So part of this podcast, because it's you know, an embodiment podcast, is everyone that comes on, I like to I say, can you give a, a, even a brief experience to people? And that might be that you know, people might be listening on the subway or walking around or driving in their cars. Mm -hmm. You have to be aware of that. I guess the first thing is just to notice how you're moving now. Like we're quite mm -hmm. animated, maybe a little chaotic in kind of how we are. You know, it's, just, it's like to notice people listening to this, I guess, can just notice the movement around them. Are they in a mm -hmm. flowing, you know, walking along the beach? Are they, you know, staccato on the way to work someday? How might they notice this actually in their life, like right here, right now? Yeah, I mean, styles of walking are a great way to explore the rhythms, actually. And like you say, you know, you can, you can walk along the streets in a, in, a, in a very unhurried way and you're just taking everything in, looking around, you're not really trying to get somewhere in a hurry. And that would be a very flowing way to walk. Or, yeah, you can be totally destination-focused and goal-oriented and walk in a very straight line and barge other people out of the way. That would be a staccato way to walk. And... Um, and then you could do the sort of headless chicken walk where you're like you're in some massive sale in Oxford Street on <laughs> New Year's Day and you don't really know what you're looking for. And so you're walking all over the store without really knowing where you're going. That would be a chaotic walk. And uh, I guess you could be walking along a beach, smoking a big reefer and doing a lyrical walk. Or something. Skipping, skipping like, and... Uh... Skipping, yes, you <laughs> can skip. Or, well, I suppose just those, those days where you just feel great. You know, yeah. And you've, you've got a spring in your step. Yeah. That's the lyrical thing is when you've got a spring in your step and then a still walk would be, yeah, maybe you just pause every now and then. God, we never do that. Do we mm. just walk it like walking somewhere, just stopping sometimes. I mean, I would advocate that, you know, if you want to practice, hi everybody. So if you want to like something to practice, just stop for a moment, stop, <sighs> you know, I think, I think stillness, that last rhythm is like, it's like we're, we're desperately thirsty for that rhythm. We're missing out because our technology is, is robbing us of it. 
because we're all practicing talking and communicating with apps that enable us to completely avoid moments of silence or pause in, mm. in conversations. You know, we're having a conversation with someone in, a, in an app, through an app on a phone. The moment there's a pause, we'll switch apps or send an emoticon and say goodbye or just do something else. You know, we never, via that mechanism, we never sit with somebody and actually just be with those moments of pause, those moments of silence. And you know, I remember when I was young, those moments of silence were always, you know, they're, it's a bit awkward because immediately the intimacy level jumps up a, a whole quantum level. Mm. But now people are just have so little pause time. You, know, you, you get to a station platform, you've been going for a train, you get to the station platform, you've got three minutes to wait for the station, out, uh, wait for the train, out comes the phone. And people are avoiding just stopping yeah. using te- yeah. technology. And so, yeah, that would be my practice for anybody who's listening. I'd just stop for a moment. Stop yeah, and it- take a breath and let yourself feel how you feel. Mm. Let yourself actually experience what you're sensing with your body. Like what, what are you smelling? What, do you, what can you see? What can you hear? What, what's the texture of your clothes like? Is the wind in your face? You no, know, like f- to feel what you are sensing. That wonderful phrase, come to your senses. You yeah. Know? yeah. How often in a day do we do that? And I you know, certainly noticed that in the kind of podcast format. I was having a great conversation with a guy called Don Hannah Johnson last night, yesterday. And just to be able to pause every now and again in the conversation, even though we're excited and we want to see each other. And there's this urge to kind of fill up space. You know, I, I get the thing with the phone. So what, you know, what I also love about uh, the rhythms, Adam, is that it's a moving practice, right? So it's not just mindfulness, stillness, meditation, as it were. It's yeah. you can also be aware of how you are moving through life, which is how we spend so much of our life. Mm. Totally. And there's a, like a kernel of, of total still presence that for really high quality practice in the five rhythms needs to be there which is exactly the same as any other mindfulness practice. Yes, it's a movement practice, basically. But um, without that totally still presence in the middle of it, um, I think it loses something and, bec- and, and becomes, well, I'll say it the other way around. I think that with, that, with an awareness of a very still presence inside of all the, all the movement, that that ex- extends and, and deepens the experience of the five rhythms and, and makes the difference from it just being, a, oh, yeah, I'm just going to let go and dance to a, to a really sharp move, um, meditation practice. Yeah, and I definitely movement. see some people approach it, like, as you say, like a really sharp discipline where they're, you know, I'm going to be really present for two hours. And sometimes I do that. And, and sometimes, frankly, I'm not in the mood, you know, like, like <laughs> it's, it's not my core practice, but I, I certainly yeah. have got a lot of benefit from it. Um, yeah. and I was also, I, I danced the wave, which is maybe the most common format, you know, evening class, mm. uh, this four, I think in Brighton now. And uh, I danced that for a number of years before I went to a workshop. And when I went, I went to uh, a heartbeat workshop with Kate Sheila and one with Elaine, who's in Brighton. And that, you know, is a different experience to go deeper into it. And can you say a little bit about some of the, these mirrors and heartbeats? There's all these kind of formats, aren't there, aside from just the sort of standard two-hour evening class? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, um, each of the rhythms, it, it turned, Gabrielle realized when she stumbled across the rhythms and started teaching people to move in that way, she then had a, a moment of kind of insight into that pattern where she realized that the pattern itself is is kind of an embodiment of much more than just movement styles. And she realized that each of the rhythms, for example, is an embodiment of an aspect of the human psyche. So you've got body, heart, and mind, which everybody, I guess, would agree about. You've got you know, physicality, and you've got emotions, and you've got thoughts. But you've also got um, what she called soul and spirit. And by soul, she meant the the experience of self where your body heart and mind are in total unity so this is the, this is what athletes call the zone and what any good artist will be in when they're really in like top quality um creative mode um 
And that, so that experience is, is what she calls soul, where someone's just like on fire or like switched on. And that human being is you know, like a bright light in that moment. And so that's the experience of soul and the experience of spirit is at that level, at the level of spirit. Gabrielle, I love this way she put it. At that, at that level, there's only one of us here. There's not just that we're a bunch, it's not just that you and me are connected, you know, which we can be, very, we can be two separate people and feeling very connected in, um, in conversation like this, but that at, a, at the level of spirit or the fifth element, there is only one of us here. We are literally one. And so those are the five aspects of the psyche, uh, body, heart, mind, soul, and spirit. And Gabrielle created a workshop format or a way to explore um, each of those aspects of the psyche. And so waves, actually, where you're just doing the rhythms, is the, is the way of exploring the body level of the psyche. And then heartbeats, you explore the emotional level of the of a human being of yourself. So you'll, you'll dance through your feelings and there are, yeah. and again, you, you get that sort of prism or kaleidoscope of five. Then you, you it, within your emotional world, you have essential five energies of fear, anger, sadness, joy, and compassion. And you can take any one of those and dance through a, dance through all five rhythms. And likewise, there's a workshop for the mind, a workshop for the soul and a workshop for the spirit. And that's what those different sort of titles of work or levels of workshop are. There's one for each level of the psyche. And as I understand that on some of these workshops, it, it, it is, they're quite free in their format. It doesn't always look like you might, someone might imagine a fire rhythms class to look like. Uh, in- no, you need different to really, to really be able to explore those other levels. You need to, you need to bring in other things than just physical movement. Yeah, um, particularly for uh, mind and soul and spirit levels, uh, the emotional level, you can pretty much do it all just through physical movement. Yeah, yeah, and and just on the kind of body level is kind of maybe the easiest access there. Um, mm. Sometimes different body parts seem to be associated with the different rhythms, or there's a way into them. Sort of like letting the head go to find chaos, for example. I found yeah. found helpful, and maybe using. Yeah. The feet for flying, well, the, hands for yeah. Lyrics. There were a couple of there've been a couple of breakthroughs since I started mm. dancing the five rhythms in. I seriously started in ninety one. I, I actually started in eighty eight, but I didn't know what it, what it was for three years. But since I seriously started in ninety one, there've been a couple of breakthroughs, so, so d- big developments in the five rhythms world. And one was when Gabrielle totally transformed lyrical in the late nineties, from it being a rather sort of light and fluffy just playful kind of zone into like seriously like um, trance sort of trance experience and the musical change that we were using and um, so lyrical got completely revamped in the late 90s and then the second big transformation or big development that happened was in the early noughties and Gabrielle realized that there was a part of the body that is kind of an easy access point to each one of the rhythms and that the feet that finding a fluid movement with your feet is the simplest way to, to kind of induct a group into the, the rhythm of flying. And that the hips and belly uh, uh, are an easy access point for staccato. Letting the head go, like you say, is an easy access, access point for chaos. Arms and hands naturally bring out lighter lyrical qualities mm-hmm. of movement in people. And that the movement of the breath is the gateway to stillness. Mm-hmm. So okay. Gabrielle called these the physical gateways. to the brain. Nice. And that's something that people yeah. can play with, maybe listening to this, obviously, with totally. the caveat of being yeah. careful of letting the head go if you're driving and all the rest of it. But, uh, you know, like, yeah. like that's something as you walk down the street, you can just let the head go a little bit and notice what that does. Or, you know, sometimes imagine my feet are like a river flowing along the pavement or, you know, it, without looking too weird, because even in Brighton, people will point and stare. The, to move the hands a little bit and sort of get get that kind of light lyrical quality that the you know moving the hands and the fingers and you can just swing your arms a little more than usual yeah you know, and watch what happens to your mood and I notice it in my voice you know people may have heard then just as soon as I move my hands a little bit like it becomes a bit lighter and I'm like da 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 and then like if it's staccato you know there's, there's like sometimes I work in business environments where you can't do the full movements right but you can still access the patterns. Mm-hmm in ways that aren't, aren't too weird for people. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. And sometimes I've done work in that, in that kind of context, in a business context, but we won't 
dance at all. We'll do the entire thing with walking. We'll go through the way of just, just with walking styles. And it's, even that is a, is a very um, transformative experience for people who have never done anything like that before. You get a room full of people and just to walk consciously yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd use that one a lot in business. It's just like, okay, let's get up out of your chairs and walk around the room. Okay, yeah. now walk around a bit differently without being yeah. silly about it. Now walk around a bit differently in this way. And, you know, and, and people get that and it can really open it up. I mean, I think, you know, the music definitely helps. Maybe let's talk about music a little bit. No one on the podcast so far has talked about music. And um, we mm-hmm. mostly have people that, you know, Aikido or, you know, different practices and they uh-huh. weren't involving music. And I find music can really de- quickly deepen me into an embodiment. Like in a way, music is packaged mood, right? It's packaged embodiment. It's drug. It's taking someone else's embodiment and putting it into my body through my ears. It's kind of weird, really. So um, say a little bit about music and embodiment. Well, I immediately think of my kids, you know, and as soon as they can stand up, if there's music going on, they'll start dancing. Yeah. I'm sitting on a yoga ball to do this. So. <laughs> and they'll, they'll just jiggle around their little toddler legs immediately. And I think, you know, we've just got a very natural relationship with music. And these two go together, music and dance just go together. And in fact, in terms of the five rhythms, dance is a flowing phenomena. Music is a staccato phenomena. Flowing and staccato are essentially masculine and feminine um, polarities within the rhythms. They go together really well. Music and dance go together. And, you know, you were saying earlier how hard it is for some people to, to let go and just move freely. But that's not natural. You know, it's yeah. natural to yeah. be able to move and let go and enjoy music and move as soon as there's a beat. And so that, that you can see that in kids before they can talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dance before they can talk. Two two years old, rocking to the beat, you know. And so, but but, you know, music always has a music always has a kind of a particular sort of quality to it, you know. And you you get different kinds of music are naturally going to inspire different kinds of movement. It's a massive teaching tool for me. You know, yeah. I, I use high quality DJ software mm-hmm. on my laptop and I have a lot of music of like, all different styles. The days of my early days of carrying a box with 40 cassette tapes to a workshop. Well, it's over. so much easier now, isn't it? I mean, you guys, oh God. Like your practice, the technology, I, I look yes, at, I don't know, really helped. Ginny, Ginny Farman's like, you know, just the amount of music she's got from all over the world as well. You know, mm-hmm. we, um, my friend, mm-hmm. Rachel, my colleague, Rachel was playing, uh, the recorded sound of a leopard purring, you know, in, in a workshop <laughs> in the, the other day. And, and I was, was, you know, she yeah. kind of, she's not a fire resistance teacher, but she's going through a similar process. And towards the end, it was this, you know, big cat purring that someone had recorded in Africa. And uh, wow. yeah, right. it was really a, Great idea. It was a wonderful track. I highly recommend it. Mm. Uh, there's some guy who records animals up close. That's like his thing. Right. But I'm just using that as an example of how, how much is available to us. You don't have to have a band in the corner or bring a live leopard in, you know, like how much is available. And it seems like there's a real skill to that. Like I've never tried to lead a free movement classes in my trainings, even though I've been around it for 10 years, Mm -hmm. because it just seems like there's a real skill to that, that, uh, and I've been in five classes where the teacher was newer or they had an off day and it was a totally different process than being in a five of class, say you or Kate Sheila or Elaine or, you know, one of the sort of senior teachers I've, I've played with. Um, say something about this. It's a craft. Of that. It, yeah. it, it's a craft, you know, and, and crafts um, can be worked at and honed. And yeah, it's definitely a craft uh, to, to be able to sense in the room. Cause you know, I don't, I never plan my sets. Yeah. I, um, and because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen in the room. I don't know who's going to show up. Yeah. When at the beginning of the class, I, I don't know what's going to come. And so I always want to be able to be able to play music that is just going to like open the next door for the group. There's always a next step, you know, it's, it's, for any group process or any individual process, there's always mm. a next step. And it's like, what's the next step? So I'll pick music that will just, just kind of tease out the next step. And it's the most powerful teaching tool I have. And it's amazing. And it seems to me that more, should we say, experienced embodiment teachers in every format have kind of a map and kind of an idea of what they might do. I'm, you know, I'm doing a corporate mm-hmm. training on creativity on Friday. And it's like, I've got kind of an idea and I've got some plans. You know, I have a handout. Mm-hmm. But really, I'm going to go into the room and go, okay, what's here? Who's here? 
How are they? What do they need? Listen, 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 create, create, create. And like that seems to be the more advanced way of working. It's a bit of a danger for newer students. I found my newer embodiment students do need more of a struct, like class plan and structure. That's not you know a bad thing until you can let go of that. Um, so what are you doing? Like, let me get a sense of it. So like, sometimes I see the teachers standing by their computer. Sometimes they're dancing in the group. Like, what are you doing as an embodiment teacher during that class? Great question. Um, mostly I'm doing what you just said, listening. Like a sort of a cyclic, in a cycle of listen, create, listen, create. But the way that I listen has a few different facets. So um, I de- I'll definitely use my own, my own body as a kind of radar. Um, I grew up in a family where there was a lot of hidden stuff going on. Mm. And so it was a matter of survival for me to, to have a good kind of instinct for emotional stuff. And I've definitely got that. I, I can just, I can feel stuff in, in my own body. And that's the, that's the sort of most useful radar I have. I also use my eyes and watch what's happening in the room. Um, and then I also have a, I have, you know, because I've doing, been doing this so long, so I have quite, quite a kind of kaleidoscopic, extensive um, awareness of how the maps of, that Gabrielle created work. And if this is happening, what's likely to need to happen next on a theoretical level. Yeah. And I, yeah. I definitely use that too. And, and you're you know, tracking and maybe 20, 50, 100 people sometimes, right? You can have... A large number. Yeah, but you know, I don't. I, I'm not really track. I don't feel like I'm tracking individuals. Right. I occasionally, occasionally, I'll find that my attention is just drawn to an individual, and then I'll trust that. I'm very intuitive, really. You know, like if my attention is really drawn to someone in a moment, I can, I can just kind of get an intuitive hit of whether that's about them or whether they're just like it's like a kind of Belisha beacon in the room for like. Pay attention to having this is a kind of yep. sign of something. That the avatar. Really yeah. And so what are the skills that get better? Like what are the skills that in your 20 years of doing this, that, that improve as a facilitator doing this? Being able to separate out what is my own bullshit from what is accurate seeing and sensing in the room. You know, because inevitably my own kind of filters obscure my ability to see clearly and sense clearly. So that's definitely got better as I've got older and done more of my own inner work. I've got better at seeing and sensing clearly. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I've developed the skill of playing music in a way that works for groups. I've also got better at, saying things in it like you know i'll often i'll often speak through a microphone to give yeah. instruction to a group who are in the middle of movement um and and also we'll have times where in a particularly in a longer workshop not a class but in a longer workshop where i sit everybody down and, and just give them some theory for a while or or, or I invite people to speak themselves a bit because you know sometimes by the time you've been working a day or two there's a lot of stuff happening and it's useful for me to be able to voice that sometimes. So I've got better at all that talking stuff. Yeah. And I, and I find you probably talk less as well, right? Like I noticed beginner teachers tend to try and control it a bit too much or they, they talk too much. Well, yeah, I, I guess I, <clears throat> I talk less than I, I leave long gaps for people to move without getting any instruction. Definitely. But I've always been like that actually. And um, and there's one way in which I talk more than I used to, which is you know, in those moments where I'm giving people theory or like where I've got something to say about what's happening in the room. You know, I, I guess I, I just know more. I know more stuff and I see more stuff and I've lived more than when I started teaching when I was 30. I went, I'm, for the first five years, I had nothing to say about life or what people's inner experience might be. I, you know, I would say, Okay, move your feet. Oh. <laughs> okay, let's let's take a partner now. But that was it. You know, I didn't have anything to say in terms of, sort of life wisdom, and, and now I have to watch myself and not say too much. You've been around a bit more, yeah, rabbit on a bit. Yeah. And is there a danger in music? Because what I see with music is that it puts me so strongly and quickly into a state. Like if I, you know, put on Guns and Roses now and started jumping around, I'd be very quickly state shifted. Yeah, mm. but I'm. 
is there a risk of becoming reliant or dependent upon the music? It's like a, maybe a definitely kind of, you know what i mean like i have to cause definitely I always play music right i can't be in a board meeting and i can kind of maybe imagine it in my head yeah all right but, you know i'm not going to stick no, it, it, roses all it the becomes time. a crutch and um i i get quite impatient with people about it actually and i i love working with no music and um, when i'm teaching a workshop i'll always have some time in a weekend or you know whatever it is a week long i'll always have some time where I work with no music um, but often, even a, even in the evening class, a two-hour evening class, um, I will I will have some time where people at least five for ten minutes where people get to move without music because I think I think it's it just it it gives people a different kind of access to their yeah. musical experience and their creativity and their freedom and you know people so people can get dependent on the music and that that's not freedom. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It could be a great way of opening something new for someone that I've seen. Though, do you know what I mean? It can kind of kick them into a place they wouldn't be able to go just on their own. And um, I think I underuse music, actually. We also, um, on our trainings, either Frankie or Rachel, will use music in the breaks to shift the mood of the group in mm. breaks. So, and the question, we, I, I worked for one company, Newfield, that had a full-time DJ on all their trainings and all their coach trainings, even though they didn't use music at all in the actual work. Uh, Because a way of shifting mood and what the DJ will say is they'll say, Mark, what mood do you want people in at the end of the break? And I'll say energized or relaxed or focused or playful. And then they'll use the music and they'll do like a little 15, 20 minute wave sometimes with people to help people shift into a way which is going to be constructive for the next activity. And that's a feature of our trainings now, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's, it's a very powerful tool. So, just looking at time here, we've got a bit of time, but one thing I want to talk about is fire rhythms, like as a thing, like as an organisation, and we've we've talked a little bit about this before. Um, so, fire rhythms is, is like a brand, right? Like I couldn't just start mm-hmm. teaching fire rhythms tomorrow and say, right now this is the fire rhythms class. It, no. you know, we get sued if I tried that. Actually, I mean, I understand Gabrielle Roth's husband was excellent; she's dead now, but her husband was a lawyer, and there yeah. is this sense that it's a very definite thing or a brand and on the one hand there's the sort of controlling of standards which you know is a positive thing yeah. and on the on the other hand there's you know people i know who aren't willing to go through kind of a certification process they so can never call themselves that yeah. and it's got an edge around it hasn't it like this is fire rhythm it has it's not yeah. can you say a little bit about that because that's different from say contact improvisation yes in a way well, the, the, the contact improv world decided a long to, a long time ago to make their work open source yeah and uh, and Gabrielle tried that at first, but what she found was that, that there were people giving five rhythms sessions yep. in different places that were really bad yeah and and she was like, okay, this is not going to work I have to yep. I have to control I want to the quality of this work to be maintained, and hence the she go. Uh, got intellectual copyright for the whole thing and yeah this is a challenge i'm facing with the embodied yoga principles work now is as it grows and i'm teaching people and they're teaching people you know it's like what else is out there and there was an instance that someone came to a half day workshop in london and then blogged about it and they did an eyp pose and i use it as a teaching piece now because there's 12 separate mistakes in this pose that they're showing on their blog and wow. they weren't, I don't think, saying they were teaching it, though they may well, it's particularly prevalent in yoga to sort of go to a half-day work. I had someone come to a half-day addictions workshop and then say, oh, so when I'm teaching this next week, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like I wouldn't even dream of teaching, you know, something after doing a half-day workshop. And uh, sometimes it's well-meaning and well-intended. And it can also be this sort of teenage thing of like, nobody, don't cage me in. Who are you to say what I can and can't do? And, and, you know, as a British person, I have a slight reaction to the fucking TM sign on everything, you know? Mm. Like that sort of copywriting of everything is quite American. Mm. It's a cultural piece mm. here. And I know the Russians and the Israelis, for example, are also sort of demons. You know, I was in Russia recently and there was one bucks coffee with the almost exact same symbol as Starbucks. And, you know, I know it's a bit of an issue there when I'm training as well. And there's a different, you know, it's all com- communist communal shared ownership, of course. So, um, yeah, there's cultural factors. But it's, it's well, and there, there they've got a, a very particular relationship with authority as well. And yeah. I think all those, the, the, the whole issue of relationship to authority is a staccato one. And staccato boundaries, straight lines and authority, they're all in the same zone. And, yeah, it's, uh, it's easy to get pissed off about it, for sure. 
I know it's easy. To, it's easy to criticize it too, and yeah, it's. I don't know what the answers are. You know that I, I, I think it's very difficult to get that stuff right. It is, and isn't it? It's easy I, to criticize from the outside and say, yeah, when you're not in a position of authority, uh, and yeah. there's a lot of way in which the alternative world can be quite teenage. Generally, I'd say. And yeah. Well, authority has become, uh, and everything staccato, you know, staccato is the masculine polarity of the rhythms. Yeah. Everything staccato has become extremely unfashionable. Yeah, it's so bad. Authority is very unfashionable. The police, yeah. the doctors, the government, yeah. the lawyers, all of that has become, the church, the, all of that's become very unfashionable. And, yeah. you know, I, I understand why, and rightly so, in a way, that you know, the whole patriarchal thing that we've been brewing for the last 10,000 years is over. There's a pushback, and, isn't there? There's a real pushback and sometimes maybe too far in the other, the other direction. Well, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I would describe it as a push forward. I mean, I, th- I think, you yeah, know, we had, we had, goodness knows how many millennia of matriarchy and, and flowing. Era, there was a flowing era to, to humanity mm. and there's been 10,000 years of staccato and we our generation is that you know, this is the time where we're just going into that third rhythm yeah and it, it's very clear where the world is tipping into chaos yeah and, on every level and what what that in terms of the rhythms what that means is that the feminine has come back in to and mesh with the masculine and that's what creates chaos the rhythm of chaos and so we're seeing the, you know, the rise of the, the women and being empowered and the, the whole notion of the feminine being just as valuable as the masculine is that's the zeitgeist. And, you know, so the fall of the masculine as being the ultimate power is, is very timely. But I think we throw the baby out with the bathwater as a barrel. And the shadow side of chaos is, is this kind of unruly wild card that will just burn the village down and we're, we'll be in trouble. Yeah, and you, you lose, you throw away boundaries at a great cost. You know, and, to, and actually, in terms of the five rhythms, to really be in, to be really be in creative chaos practice, you need good boundaries. Yeah, it's not just a kind of like where you, you need to take the 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 medicine, if you like, or the the state of being that is flowing and staccato, and add to those. You know, you don't throw them away. You, you the next stage has its roots in flowing a staccato and, and out of that you, you get the rhythm of chaos. Yeah, it's and, interesting, isn't it, to talk about these things in terms of sort of masculine and feminine. I know this can be quite kind of triggering things for people. And I notice what comes up for me as soon as any guest even starts to go near these topics is fear. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. okay, we well, could get in trouble now. If someone misinterprets what Adam Let's do it. I'm going to get some trouble. Come saying on. Mark is patriarchal, or maybe some complaints from some men saying Adam's anti man, or, you know, like it's like, like uh, you, can, you can get it from either angle, any side. And I, I noticed that's funny that it didn't even, even three years ago, for me, there, mm. and there's, you know, I grew up with feminist family and a certain sensitivity to some of these things, but I noticed in, mm. in the last few years, it's got particularly. Uh, vicious, dangerous, scary, yeah. and, and, I, and I won't write this off by people just saying, "Well, that's you know because your patriarchal ways are dying." And da, 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 da. no, 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 it's something more than that. It's got a little unpleasant when I'm censoring myself talking to one of my friends, you know. Yes. So, and I'm, I'm yes. noticing that just now in my head. I was like, "Oh, careful, shut up, Mark," you know. And I, I think there's something. Yeah, up. there's a kind of. I mean, fascism is is abroad in a lot of ways and sort of fundamentalist ways of thinking, uh, you know, people are getting very attached to certain thought forms and um, yeah, the sort of fascist, fascist uh, commitment to balance and freedom is a very paradoxically ironic situation. And it's coming out explicitly, but it's also coming out. I see more than explicitly coming out sideways as this authority gets pushed down and repressed and mm-hmm. pushed into. How dare you tell me what to do? And there's no leaders and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Coming out as sort of controlling language and can, can coming out in sort of like a mm-hmm. weird sideways staccato. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Which isn't honest and it's mm-hmm. disguised as something else. That's also what I'm seeing in the world. Um, I, I just I just did a Facebook post yesterday and I like got this. And there were lots of amazing comments but what one woman just really had a go at me for yeah. um for being like she said it's like you're telling you're telling people off mm. but the way that she was 
doing that was really yeah, telling you me off. off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How dare you say you know stuff? I know stuff. How dare you tell people what uh, I don't do that? Uh, it's sort of funny, isn't it? You go, whoa. It's really funny. Hey, walk away. Yeah. Let that person develop. But yeah. um, and, and culturally, let's talk a little bit about culture because I know people listen to this all over the world. You know, like I had mm. comments from Germany and Russia. The, 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 the podcast actually went live yesterday, so it's a bit of a lag between, you know, when this will be online. And, mm. um, you know, I saw people all over the world responding to it and saying, hey, can you get this person on? I really like this, which is fab. Mm. You know, we just made the Facebook post, uh, the Facebook uh, page. Um, now, you've, you dance, I'd say, as internationally as anyone or any embodiment teacher. I mean, your travel schedule is mental. I think one year I was in 20 countries and you were in 30 or something. I mean, it's... it's no, no. Come on, how many countries are you in a year? You're in Australia, Croatia, no, the Arab world. Yeah, I don't know, but not 30 because I, I have kids and I'm at home half the time with them. But you, so I mean, you have wide... It looks, a bit, it, it, it looks a bit more wild than it really is, but... But I, I have worked in a lot of different countries and I really notice that like the differences between countries show up much more vividly on a dance floor than they do on a high street. Yeah. And so, you know, you can be in just just different countries in Western Europe. Yeah. Where, you know, you walk down the high street, it's all the same shops and people pretty much look the same and the kind of ambiance is the same, more or less. But you get on a dance floor, and the, the differences are immediate and visible, and, and striking and touching. It's, Give it's us some very, examples, and maybe people listening to this can also notice if there's a cultural movement pattern where they are. You know, like for example, when I'm in Israel, I know there's often this very abrupt and direct pattern. You know, people throw mm -hmm. menus on the table in the restaurant. I'm like, whoa! You know, it's it's kind of from a British yeah. more circular point of view. If you don't mind, I'll be sorry. It's, it's kind of a bit abrasive. Yeah. You know, and they don't mean yeah, they, it's rude. It's just a movement pattern that's in the system. There, the, 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 I've only thought in Israel once so far. I'm going again next year, but um, I definitely there were definitely some authority issues in the room. Should we yes. say? Yeah, and, and there's history to that, right? As one of my Israeli yeah. friends, said, well, all the yeah. on the train when they were told are all dead. You know. Right. And I was right. like, whoa, okay, that yeah. gave me a different perspective on why yeah. the participants didn't want yeah. to be told what to do in my workshop. You know? But then, then the English are, the English also don't like being told what to do, but they have a very different way of dealing with it. The English will, yeah. the English will do this kind of subtle, silent rebel thing. A passive aggressive, they the, sideways. Yeah, side. they're very passive aggressive. And so the, the, you'll get this kind of undermined sabotage moves happening that you can't really quite see how they're happening. Yeah. And then the Germans are completely the opposite. And you know, Germans are still trying to um, make good and they will really do their best. Yeah. To, you know, they, in, there, in the classical sense, they're really easy to teach because they'll, they really look, they really want to do well. And, yeah. Uh, apply themselves. The Swiss, are, the Swiss tend to be a bit uptight. Um, <laughs> Because people might mm. say it sound like we're talking in stereotypes here. You know, I don't want comments like, you guys are racist. It's, it's not really, it's about culture being... It's just what I see. Pattern, right? It's just, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. just what I see. And, and Eastern Europe? Yeah. Eastern Europe tend to be very conservative and restrained, withheld. A little stiff. At first. In the body, yeah. yeah, a little stiff. But it's like you scratch the surface and poof, out yeah, comes this like, well. emotional, very hearty... Um, sweet innocence that is just a delight to work with. And the United I States, Southern Europe, I know you've worked all over. The United States is, is different, very different uh, depending on where you are. Um, so the West Coast definitely are, they, they, you know, they like to have a good time, shall we say. Uh -huh. and a certain kind of um, antipathy to depth can be experienced. Let's say, and uh, whereas in the New York side of things are, are much more driven and uh, yeah, so intense. They don't they don't have that floaty thing that the Californians have. I mean, it's, as we, and one might expect in many ways, and obviously individuals are different, and there's subcultures and you know ethnic cultures. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But it's impossible to say culture doesn't exist. I just see it again and again totally. and again. In, in, in the way people move in workshops. And it, I was talking to a, a senior American embodiment teacher yesterday. I said, maybe something that's missing out of the American kind of narrative of embodiment is an understanding of culture just because it's the kind of melting pot theory. You know, and I think that's in, as you move around all these little European countries, one definitely sees the differences there. Yeah. Okay. 
we've gone through kind of a lot of ground here. I just want to take a breath and, and I kind of go, okay, what have we looked at? We've introduced people to fire rhythms. If they were newer to that, that's profound. I would highly recommend anyone getting to a class if they can, you know, particularly if you're from a more form based embodiment practice, it's a real joy. I go with my wife sometimes, you know, there's classes all over the world. I mean, particularly in the United States, European countries, England, loads of classes in London, right? If people are listening there. Mm. Um, we Yeah, so what I, what I would suggest is that people go to fiverhythms.com, wherever you are in the world, and uh, and you can find a class that way. And then there's the open floor group who kind of came out of Fire Rhythms. And they didn't want to have some of the constraints, you know, some of the intellectual property stuff we were talking about. It's, they're doing some interesting things. Yeah. It's like they're sort of reinventing yeah. dance movement therapy, basically. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, it looks like that's some interesting groups that are doing slightly different things. And there's other free movement practices as well, aren't there? You know, there's movement, there's medicine. movement medicine and there's uh, movement medicine, which is uh, also worth investigating and soul motion. Those are the main ones that have come out of the five rhythms. Uh-huh. Which, yeah. Offshoots of the five rhythms. Freedom dance. A guy in Russia does that. Oh yeah. And yeah. you know, Alex, I knew, knew Alex actually. And, um, yeah. You know, this, so this, uh, we would just recommend people to at least try these things, right? Like if you've never totally. done it before, um, yeah. we've looked a little bit of... Although I would say five rhythms is the best. But. <laughs> like I said, you're a cult. There's, there's definitely that loyalty to the practice and uh, I respect... Okay. Let me say, okay, let me say something about this, Mark. The reason, the reason I say that is because um, a couple of years ago, I realized that the iconic gemstone of the world of pure mathematics which is euler's identity it's yeah i wanted a, to come to an, this okay so it's an equation that links together the five most fundamental numbers there are um <laughs> listeners if you're not mathematicians if you are mathematicians you'll know immediately what i'm talking about but if you're not mathematicians well you take the number zero number one yeah i guess everyone can recognize their like basic num yeah basic to the nature of maths and then there's number pi we all know about pi which is the number that is intrinsic to all circles. And because it's intrinsic to all circles, it's intrinsic to all waveforms as well. And pendulums and orbits of planets. And so the number pi is also kind of intrinsic to the nature of this reality that we find ourselves in. Now there's two other numbers that are stand out like similar ilk of fundamental. They're called E and I. And I won't try and explain what they are now, but take it from me. Those five numbers relate to each other in a way that is so extraordinary, so simple, so beautiful that mathematicians for the last 300 years have been going, wow, since Euler, the Swiss mathematician, discovered that the way that they relate to each other and interface with each other. I have realized that those, that pattern that is that equation, the way those numbers relate to each other, is the exact same pattern as the five rhythms. Each of those numbers has the same character as one of the rhythms. Numbers have a character, you know, like flow, like pi has a character of circular motion. It, all numbers have a character. Those five are very full of character, actually. They have very strong characters. And each one of them is exactly the same character as one of the rhythms. And they, the way they interlock with each other precisely describes the relationship between the five rhythms. And the fact that that is so, and... I'm working on how to communicate to the world exactly how it is so. And, you know, for for now, let's just say it is so. I know it's, I'm absolutely certain that it's so. It's like I can just see it as plain as day. And the fact that it is so means that the five rhythms are, there's something special about that pattern. There really is. There's nothing else like it in pure maths. And pure maths is the most essential of all the sciences. It's It's like the the kind of most thing in science because it's the most thing in pure maths and it's the same as the five rhythms the five rhythms are special there's something about that pattern that is magic i i would make the same argument about my wife being the most beautiful woman in the world <laughs> I, I i'm prepared to to leave this one open for people but uh <laughs> i love that you're innovating and i love that you're that you're looking deeper into what you do and i love that you're passionate about your thing you know in terms of what you do i know you do great classes so i certainly recommend your work to people adam uh, i feel you. like i want to talk for another hour but i've got peter blackaby one of the top yoga teachers in britain coming in in, in 15 minutes I okay you let's wrap today. it up soon it's like yes, it's I always need to gorgeous to, to talk to you man you've got so much to you too mark any sort of final before we talk about where people can find you online 
um, any kind of final message to the embodiment community or something you want to say about anything at all? Oh, take a breath. Same thing. Yeah, stop. Actually, ironically, as a movement teacher, I'd say stop, but feel and then move a bit and then stop again. Beautiful. Thank take you. Take a breath. Um, where can people find you, sir? Is it adambarley.com? Well, as it happens, next month in London, I am workshopping my insights around the maths because the maths has taught me some new stuff about the rhythms that in 29 years I haven't realized. It's taught me two fundamental things about the five rhythms that, that have really changed my practice and my teaching. And so you know, three days, end of October, I mean, you can look at my website, adambarley.com, and it's on there. Um, I'm workshopping the insights that I've got from the maths. Um, so that would be the first stop. But I mean, if you're not, if you can't come to London, then just look at adambarley.com. Yeah, we've got a bit of a backlog on the podcast getting them out. So hopefully we'll get it out before then, but it might not be much before okay. then. Um, but okay. I know you'll be doing these ongoing and, you know, there's lots, yeah. of, other, lots of other things there. So I'll share on the yeah. podcast the, the, the big fight, the main fire rhythm site and adambarley.com so people can... Mm-hmm can check you out oh, find you on you make some good facebook posts as well so they can find you on social media i'm sure too yes they can yeah adam it's been gorgeous man virtual hug totally at you. really gorgeous. nice to see you mark real pleasure yeah, Take thanks care, for sir. the invite yes Cheers. bye-bye bye if you enjoyed this episode subscribe to get more if you'd like to help us build the embodied tribe leave a review on itunes or share this on your social media if you're interested in training globally sign up to receive the newsletter at embodiedfacilitator.com until next time Welcome home to the body.